Amen. Amen. So if you want to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5, that's where we're picking up in our sermon series. We left off at verse 7 uh, last week, which is like in the middle of a sentence, but whatever. You know, that's how we roll. Uh, so let me read the text for today and then we'll pray and jump right in. Therefore, do not become partakers with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So walk as children of light, for the fruit of life is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Give thanks always for everything to God the Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Father, thank you. Again, for this time that we get to spend in your word, thank you, God, that you, that you love us, that you've called us, that your heart and your desire is that we be more like you, Jesus. And if we're honest, we know that we need so much help to, to do that and to get to the place that you're calling us. And, and so because of that, we... Lift your name up in praise and in worship because you have not left us alone, but that you've given us your Holy Spirit, the promised helper in Scripture. Thank you, Jesus, that you don't give up on us. Thank you, Lord, that, that you're making us more and more like you every day, that we walk with you and we follow you and we seek to obey you. So help us now as we approach your word. Speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So listen, um, there is a, a festival that happens to this day. Um, but I mean, they went all out back in the day. Back when they had the temple and the temple mount, what the Jews would do is they'd have this uh, feast called the Feast of Tabernacles. And at the Feast of Tabernacles, they would have um, these massive golden candlesticks, four of them. And they would be set up in, in, the, in the, the treasury, the temple treasury. These candlesticks were so high. They were higher than the highest wall of the temple. And so what would happen is at the end of the Feast of Tabernacles, they would, they would set all of these things up. And that evening, uh, to uh, commemorate, to, to celebrate everything that God had done, uh, they would have these priests that would climb up these um, ladders to get to the top of these candles and there would be these massive bowls that were fixed to the top. And they would not just climb up a ladder, but they would climb up the ladder with 65 liters of oil. And they would then hoist these things up and pour this oil into the bowls so that when the ceremony would start, they would light the wick of these things it would, and it would, it would almost like a little explosion would take place. And the, the light from these candles was so bright that it not only lit up the temple, but it, but it was said that it would light up all of Jerusalem. And during this ceremony, you'd have the Levites who'd be playing every musical instrument you could possibly think of. And so uh, while they're playing this music, you'd have all of these uh, individuals with, with torches that would be singing and dancing the night away. An incredible, incredible celebration that, that all Jews are required to be at. An incredible celebration that uh, commemorated this time of, of God being with the children of Israel in the wilderness as that, that pillar of fire by night. This celebration of God's presence in their lives. And I bring this story up because one of the most 
incredibly fascinating accounts in all of the Gospel of John takes place when Jesus, the morning after this massive, incredible celebration, he sets himself up above all of the people and he proclaims to them, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. I mean, there is no more emphatic way he could have made this declaration than to have done it the morning after when the candlesticks were probably still black from them burning throughout the night. Everybody just fresh on their memory, this celebration that they just took part in. And there Jesus is standing before them all. Remember the fire that stood between you and Egypt. That was me. Rem remember the, the, the cloud by day and the, the pillar of fire by night. That was me. I am the light of the world, he says in John chapter 8. And whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And this immense truth that Jesus is proclaiming in John chapter 8 must be at the forefront of our mind as we dive back into the text in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. Because what Jesus has done, what, what, what God is doing through uh, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is He's opening up verse 8 with this amazing metaphor that applies to you and I. He says, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord, so walk as children of the light. Notice what he does not say. The Apostle Paul does not write, um, you once uh, walked in darkness, you uh, sometimes did dark things, but he literally said, you were darkness. And that's the beauty of this series that we're going through. Verse by verse, through the book of Ephesians, from death to life. That is the major theme or contrast that we find in the book of Ephesians. That, that we were once dead in our trespasses and sins. We were not just into doing dark stuff sometimes, but literally we were darkness. And then Jesus Christ left his throne in heaven and came to earth to save us. And now in him, if we've placed our faith and our trust in Jesus, he's become Lord of our lives. We've surrendered. We've submitted to him. We, we've confessed our sins. We're now walking in obedience with him. We're pursuing God. We go from death to life. Now we are no longer darkness, but we, listen, are light. You are light. Not because there's anything in and of itself in you that is uh, good, but because God is in you now. Because now God lives in you. He's made your heart his dwelling place. And so because of that fact, you are light, the text says. See, darkness is just the ignorance of God. You're, you're, you're without knowledge with regards to who God is. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says this, The natural man does not receive the things of God. Why? Because they're foolishness to him. But we are light. We are light. Dr. Donald uh, Gray Barnhouse I put it like this. He says, when Christ was in the world, he was like the shining sun. And when the sun sets, the moon goes up. And the moon is a picture of believers, the church. The church shines, but not with its own light. It shines with reflected light. At times, the church has been a full moon dazzling the world with an almost daytime light. Those were the times of the great enlightenment. For example, in the days of Paul and Luther and Wesley. And other times, the church has been only a thumbnail moon. And in those days, very little light shone on the earth. But whether the church is a full or thumbnail moon, whether waxing or waning, it reflects the light of Christ. Our light does not originate from within us. And the Apostle Paul takes it a step further in the text, doesn't he? Because the Apostle Paul likens us as people who 
we don't just reflect the light. We are light. That light that we are a reflection of lives within us. Having become children of the light, being born of God, these are all all things that the book of Ephesians talks about, things that we've discussed before. We've been made the light in the Lord. We are to walk now as children of that light. I love John chapter 1. Jesus says, or it says, uh, in him, Jesus, was life. And the life was the light of men. Have you ever really thought through that process, that meditated on that? What the Bible is saying there? We have life in him. And the life that we have in him, that he lives in us is light. That's where we get it. Matthew chapter five says that, that a light is not meant to be hid under a basket, right? But rather we are to be a city on a hill for all to see. Matthew five sixteen says that, that we're to let our light so shine before men that they would glorify our father who is in heaven. And so at the end of verse 8, it says, walk as children of light. You're not darkness anymore. You are light. So because you are light, walk like it. That's what he says in verse 8. Walk like it. And if you jump down to verse 10, he says, discern what is pleasing. Discern what is acceptable to the Lord. It's not hard to figure it out. God is not trying to hide it from us. So how do we find out what is acceptable to the Lord? By walking as children of light. And so what should that walk look like? What should exemplify that walk? Well, it's found right there in verse 9. For the fruit of the light is found in all that is good, in all that is right, and in all that is true. Guys, listen. These are the graces... These are the graces that should characterize our lives as children of the light. Goodness. Right. True. These are... It's not enough to just go to church on a Sunday. Right? Because we attend a church on a Sunday morning and we sit in a chair, that has... No bearing on whether we belong to God or walk with God. It's not enough just to be dunked into a baptismal. It's not enough to just proclaim and profess that we are Christians. But there should be a walk that demonstrates that. There should be a light that screams we belong to Jesus. Not in a a forceful, arrogant, ugly kind of way, because you know, you, know you know what that looks like too, right? Proverbs 20 verse 11 says, By your fruit you shall know them, even as a child is known by what he does. There should be fruit. There should be evidence within our lives that we belong to Jesus. That does not mean we're perfect. It does not mean that we don't struggle. It does not mean that we don't make mistakes because we do. We all do. But we are a people who belong to God. So we practice repentance. So every time we fall down, we get back up by the power of the Holy Spirit and by His great grace towards us. But there should... Listen, we we cannot... Pretend that there should not be anything different than us. It doesn't make us these kind of hypocritical, I'm better than you type people, but but literally because we have God living in us, the light of the world living in us, there should be something different. I worked with a dude years ago. um, We'll call him Sparky because that was his nickname and he doesn't live anywhere near here so you'll never know who he is. But he used to be such an incredible apologist for the Lord. Man, he could, anybody who wanted to denounce or renounce Christ, man, he would, he would, no, 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 but he'd go through this whole kind of apologetic spiel and he was better than I was. I was like, man, this guy's incredible. But he was also living in an adulterous relationship that he was very open about. 
He also had the most foul mouth you'd ever, like a sailor. He, there was nothing in his life that would have said, I belong to Jesus. He just knew a lot of facts about God. He would occasionally attend a church, but was not really plugged into community. Just because we know a lot about God, just because we were raised in an environment that, that, that lifted high the name of Jesus, does not mean that we do. And so we need to check our hearts. We need to check our lives. We need to say, God, um, am I living a life that is honoring and pleasing to you with the way that I talk and the way that I walk and the places I go and the things that I allow into my life? Because it matters to God. It matters to the Lord. And furthermore, fruit in our lives, because I don't want you to leave here thinking, well, I just got to try harder. No, listen, fruit that we're talking about that, that should exist in the life of the believer, it's not going to all of a sudden show up in your life because you're trying to muster up the strength to be more like Jesus. And I'm just, I'm trying my hardest and I'm doing my best and I'm, you are going to grow so frustrated every time you, you fail and you fall and you make a mistake. You, you, because, because listen, the fruit, the good fruit that is to be produced in our lives to bring glory to Jesus doesn't come from trying harder. It comes from being in the presence of Jesus. It comes from being in the presence of Jesus who is the light of the world. Which reminds me of the story of the husband who had traveled on business to Paris. And while he was in Paris, he got his wife an anniversary gift, which was this like um, uh, matchbox that would glow in the dark. It was this beautiful uh, illuminated matchbox, really well kind of ch hand chiseled. And he brought it back to his wife and she was like, oh, that's so thoughtful. That's beautiful. It's different, you know? And so all of a sudden she kind of turned off all the lights and she couldn't find it. It was not... It was not glowing like um, the person who sold it to him uh, said it would. And so they began to grow a little bit frustrated. It's like, wait, wait, hold on a second. I paid money for this thing. It didn't even work. I didn't even do what, I, what, it, what it, the guy said it was supposed to do. And so um, out of frustration, they nearly threw the thing out until um, his, his wife remembered that she has a friend who uh, speaks French because there was an inscription on the side of the matchbox. And the inscription on the side of the matchbox said something along the lines of, in order to shine in the darkness, it needs to spend time in the light. And you know what it's like. Have you ever, as a kid, played with like glow-in-the-dark stuff? It would shine that much brighter the closer you held it and the longer you held it next to the light. And the same goes for you and I. You're not going to be more like Jesus if you're not spending any time with Jesus. It's just, that's just logic. It just makes sense, right? So we need not grow frustrated at our walk with the Lord. We need to just constantly come back to a place of dependence on the Lord. Spending time at the feet of Jesus. Spending time in the presence of the Lord. Because verse 10, it says, And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. In other words, attest what is acceptable to the Lord. We should not be a people that are so ready to compromise. Our first reaction should always be, well, I'm a Christian. I have the Spirit of God living in me. Is this something I should do? Is this something I should be partaking in? Is this, is this something that is going to bring glory and honor to the Lord? It's okay to talk to ourselves. <laughs> You know, you might want to do it under your breath so people don't think you're crazy. But, but it's okay to ask ourselves certain questions. It's okay to say, Lord, search me. Lord, what are my motives? Why am I desiring to do such a thing? God desires that we seek His face like that. God desires that we, we discern what is pleasing or acceptable to Him. And then we're admonished to, in, in verse 11, to have, what does it say? No fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather to expose them. <laughs> now, now listen, this is a verse in 2019 that will be highly, like, this just doesn't fit in with our culture, does it? For sure not. I mean, this is, this is we live in a culture that prides itself on at least 
perceived tolerance unless you disagree with them, then, you know, then, it's, then they're not tolerant towards you. But it, you know, it doesn't make any sense at all. But, but that's neither here nor there. Um, we, we, we pride ourselves on this sense of, of tolerance, don't we? On this sense of open-mindedness. And, and we, we love the kind of live and let live personality. The problem is God's word does not allow such a luxury for those of us who are believers. This does not mean that we should be the grim reapers of negativity. And everywhere we go, why are you drinking that? Why are you eating that? Why are you saying that? Why are you doing that? Just shut up, all right? <laughs> just like those people are just annoying and we all know them, right? But at the same time, we are to call sin what it is. And by calling sin what it is, we thereby expose darkness. You don't have to indulge in every fleshly pleasure in order to be relevant, in order to fit in, in order to kind of, well, I'm just trying to get in and then I'll tell them about Jesus. No, what you're doing is you're compromising and you're destroying your witness. You are, you are just like them. There is no difference. How many of y'all know that so many people who give themselves to drunkenness and drugs and lewdness and sensuality are searching for something. There, there's something in their life that is not satisfying. It's not fulfilling. And they're looking for that which will satisfy. And they will see that in you if you are living a life that is separated, that is holy, set apart for the Lord. How many times have, have you heard somebody say to you or someone in the church things like, man, I, I just want what you have. I don't get it. You're going through this, but I, I see so much joy in your life. How are you so happy? You just lost everything. Because when you live a life where your joy is not dependent on your circumstances... When, when your joy is not dependent on whether things are good or whether things are bad, people are drawn to that like a, like a moth to the flame. Because we try and we try and we try to find that which is satisfying, but that only comes in Jesus, the fountain of living water. We need to be that ethical light in the classroom in the workplace, in your neighborhood, within your family, at church. And in doing so, we will, we will risk, listen, we will risk being called things like a bigot, judgmental, hypocrite, narrow. But if God's Spirit is calling us to stand against what is wrong, then we need to be faithful to what God is calling us to. And as we've already seen, we, we prove our lives by the way that we live. The Christian cannot expect to be kept from um, contamination, if you will, of sin if he or she is uh, fellowshipping with, indulging in uh, darkness. We just can't. It doesn't even make any sense to think that that would be an, a, a possibility. Right? It's like the person who, who takes the German shepherd and, and sticks them in there with a pack of wolves thinking that that German shepherd is going to make those wolves domestic. It's just not going to happen. That German shepherd will become wild because oftentimes we're a product of our environment. This doesn't mean we don't spend time with and engage non-believers. But this means we need to be wise and mindful of the time that we spend, the things that we indulge in. Which is why Paul says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Again, it's not, it's not about whether you can be friends or, or not with people who don't know Jesus. You should be. You should be engaging people outside of the church. It's the Great Commission. <laughs> We're called to it, right? He's not saying that, but what he is saying is that we shouldn't find community within the sinful activities of the unredeemed. That should not be where we're trying to find our community in, in, in doing and partaking in things that are unpleasing to the Lord. Uh, verse 12 says, For it is 
Listen, for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. All things are made manifest by the light. In other words, all things are exposed by light. Do you understand that that is, that is also primarily speaking to us as individuals? That, that just as it says in Numbers uh, chapter 32, verse 23, that, that our sin will find us out. That as, as light shines, it exposes uh, the darkness. Have you, have you, ever, have you ever held up... Like, you ever, just don't lie, okay? Because I can't be left up here alone on this one. Um, have you ever just like grabbed something out of the hamper? I just did this on Friday. I was like, oh, this work meeting at a super fancy restaurant. I'm like, oh, it looks good to me. You know, I just kind of iron it real quick and I head it out the door. Have you ever done that? You're going to grab something dirty out of the line? Stop it, Eric. It for sure does. Every Sunday. Justin, I know it. Uh, but... But just, you just grab something, you kind of hold it up, and you're just kind of, yeah, yeah, it looks good. You know, you walk out, so you throw it on, you walk outside, and all of a sudden, as that, that shirt that was once inspected in a dark, dim apartment is now exposed by the light, you're like, oh, snap. Did I, what, did I spill an ice cream sandwich on this shirt? You know, it, it's ridiculous. I was sitting at the table before I noticed it this Friday. I was like, oh, my gosh. Let's swear this napkin as a bib, you know? But, but, but we, we, we tend to do that. But then as the light then shines on the areas that, that, that it couldn't in my dark, dim apartment, there are stains that become exposed. And in the same way, as we walk in the light, as we walk in obedience with the Lord Jesus Christ, there are going to be things in our lives that He exposes, that He puts His finger on. And, and for you, it may be completely set, something completely different from somebody else. And it's why the Bible says in John chapter 1 that we're, that we're to have grace with one another. Grace upon grace. Because God may be doing something in your life, putting a finger on an area of your life that he's like, man, I need you to, I need you to rid that. Okay? I, I need you to, that's destroying you. And somebody else may be doing the same thing, but God's not even speaking to them about it. Because God's working on a different area. If we would just remember that we got, we got like, we've got, you know, like that construction tape, the yellow tape all around. We are a work in progress. None of us are perfect. None of us are doing it perfectly. Some, sometimes we feel like, am I doing it at all? You know, I'm failing at this. But God loves us. He's for us. He's with us. He's working on us. He's making us more and more like Jesus. And we should have grace with one another because as we walk with him, Hey, that area that he's working, maybe a year from now he's going to be working on that and that other person. But know this, as we walk in the light, the light will expose the darkness. The light will expose the stains. The, the light will expose the areas in our lives that aren't kind of measuring up. And God is so patient. God is so patient with us. It's funny, I've talked to so many non-believers who are like, yeah, man, I'm going to call, come to Jesus I'm going to come to Jesus as soon as I clean up some areas of my life. You know, I got some stuff back there. I just, I don't want to bring that into the kingdom, if you will. And I'm always like, dude, he doesn't care about that. That's what I used to say. Honestly, I told the lady who first ever, she was witnessing to me every single day for months. She worked next to me. And I would tell this older lady, I'd be like, no, nah, I don't think so. You know, I, I cuss a lot. She's like, I know. I'm having conversations with you. Um, and, and she's like, and then, you know, and then it was another, and then, oh man, I've been sleeping with my girlfriend, like all the time. I can't, I can't be doing that. Man, let me fix that area of my life. And then once that's fixed and I'm kind of like celibate and stuff, then I'll come. She's like, that's not going to happen. You do not have the power within you to stop doing that. You need Jesus. You need the light to expose those areas of your life. There are things, Jimmy, in your life that you don't even realize that God's going to put His finger on. But as you walk in the light, He will expose those areas and He's so faithful and He's so gracious and He's so patient and He's so kind to work those things hey, yeah, out of our lives. We've got to trust Him. We've got to walk with Him. We've got to know that, that, that He's going to finish the work that He started within us. He promises us that in Philippians chapter 1. John 1.5, 1 John 1.5 says that God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. 
And the danger that we face as believers is, is that all of this stuff may become head knowledge. That we, we may understand this stuff intellectually, but it doesn't work itself out in our lives practically. <laughs> Which is why the Apostle Paul uh, then says, verse 14, Awake. Awake, you who sleep. Arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. He's saying, get up. Just sit around, kind of, oh, no, is this ever going to get any better? Get up. Because so often in our spiritual lives, we can become so lackadaisical. We can become so, like we're on kind of volume. or something. We're just kind of sitting around in a chair, kind of hoping. Get up. Wake up, he says. You ever have your mom do that? When back, I remember back in school, my mom, like every single day, that's why I remember it so vividly, would come into my room, Jimmy, you got school, get up. Okay, I'll be there in a second. 10 minutes later, get up. I had every excuse in the book for why I wasn't gonna get up and how, why I had enough time and if she would just be patient with me, I'm gonna get to school, whatever. And it was just, it was this constant, get up, get up, until like, you know, water was poured on me, blankets were pulled off me, that kind of thing. Like I was, I was fighting that much against getting awake. And, and for some in the church, that's you. You're, you're, you're just, you're kind of, you're spread eagle, laying down, kind of like, eh, what, it'll all come to me. And God's like, no, no, get up. Get up. Because sometimes we don't understand the severity of our situation. Sometimes we don't understand that, that, that we're, we're not walking in the light, that we're giving ourselves over to things that are not beneficial and not prosperous for us. Get up. Paul's saying, come out from among them. Be separate. Show that you're different. I mean, I know people, I'm dead serious. I know people that I've, I'm friends with, people I've been walking with for years that refused to get up. People that I'm telling you, that the, the way that God has gifted them, the way that God has created them, man, they could have been turned the world upside down or right side up 10 times over by now. But because they would not get up, they would not wake up concerning the things in the text here, sexual immorality and sensuality and pornography. And listen, they're ineffective to this day. To this day, they remain ineffective. Don't tolerate the hidden sin in your life. Confess it. Turn from it. That's the beauty about being in a community, right? Is that every single one of us should be able to raise our hand. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. Please don't raise your hand. But every single one of us should be able to raise our hand and say, man, I've got areas of weakness. I've got areas of struggle. And I can't do this alone. And what you should never do is, is, is hide those things. And not be forthcoming with those things. I'm not talking about getting up here on a Sunday morning with a microphone saying, hey, I struggle with pornography. I'm not saying doing something. I'm, I'm, but I'm saying because we're in community, whether that be through community groups or here on a Sunday or meeting for coffee throughout the week, there has to be people among you that you know, that you love, that, that loves you, that trusts you, that you can do life with, that you can confess sins one to another, as James says. That we wouldn't tolerate the hidden sin because it's really, it's not hidden from, it's not hidden. Your mom may not know about it. Your grandma may not know about it. Your spouse may not know about it. Your children may not know about it. Your neighbors may not know about it. Your employers or employees, your coworkers, they may not know about it, but God does. God does. And he will expose those things. See then, now Paul takes this hard um, right and he says, see then that you walk circumspectly. Because of all of these things that we've just spoken about, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. This is the seventh time in this epistle that the Apostle Paul uses the word walk. Why? Because it's not enough to just know a bunch of stuff. Well, I know I'm really good with theology. I know a lot about God, but you don't do anything about that knowledge of God that, that fleshes itself out practically in your life. So why Paul is over and over and over again through the epistle to the Ephesians saying, walk, walk it out, walk it out, walk it out. 
He says, walk circumspectly, which literally means uh, as you're walking, that you would be walking in a manner where you're looking all around you as if you're walking into some kind of dangerous area. That, that, that on your, your left, there's a trap. On your right, there's an obstacle that you're, that you're walking in a manner that is circumspect. There will always be temptations. There will always be sins that are trying to lure you in. That's never going to go away. It doesn't matter how long you walk with Jesus. It doesn't matter how long you're alive. Those temptations, those traps, those snares will always be there. The enemy will always be waiting with open arms for you to come back. That's why Paul says, redeem the time because the days are evil. He says the same thing. I love this. He says the same thing in Colossians chapter 4 um, verse 5. And in each of these instances, it literally means in the Greek, buy up opportunities. Buy up opportunities. Redeem the time. It's as if there's a product that you really want, but you know it's going to sell out. Man, you get on top of that. Buy up the opportunities. We, we should be as Christians eager to buy up opportunities, eager to buy up opportunities to witness for Christ, to serve the Lord, to be a means of blessing to all those you come in contact with, that we would be actively doing that. That we would be looking to buy up these opportunities to redeem the time that we're here on earth. Because the days are evil. So, so what, are we, what are we doing with the time that God has given us? <clears throat> just, just in your own minds, if you need to jot something down, jot it down. What If we opened up your diary, if we opened up your calendar... How are you using your time? Are there things you could be doing differently? I'm constantly going back over my calendar and rehashing things and erasing things and because I want to redeem the time. I want to buy up the opportunities to do all that I can for Jesus. I don't always do it perfectly, but it's something that I want to, to practice. What are we doing? What difference are we making for the Lord? Remember, there was, a, there was a old man James back in Mallorca. And I loved old man James. He was the hardest guy to hang out with that I've ever hung out with. He was a super lonely yet very extremely bitter man. I mean, he hated people. He had a cat. I don't know if those two things have anything to do with one another, but it's neither here nor there. He was a man who was in a wheelchair in his apartment and he hated people. And every week I would come and I would sit on his couch and we would have dialogue, we would have conversations. And I'll never forget this one time. It was one of my last meetings with James before he went to be, I don't know if he received the Lord or not, but, but when he passed on. And, and I'll never forget it because I, I came up alongside him and he, and he pulled open this uh, photo album and began to show me all these photos of him and his friends. He looked so vibrant. And they're walking through Santa Panza and Mallorca, the, the, the town that I lived in. And, and then they're, they're eating in this one. They're walking in this one. They're at the beach on the next one. And, and, and it was so interesting because as I was looking through this photo book with him, I was like, man, that store, is this is like 25 years old, this, these pictures. That store is still there. The beach is laid out exactly like that. That street looks identical to the way it does here today, 25 years later. But you know what didn't? James. James looked half the size. James, James was now in a wheelchair. James couldn't walk. Twenty-five years from now, there's a really good chance that New York City is going to look very much like it does today. You get a few more buildings here and there, but it'll probably look very much so like it does today. But you will not. You will not. And, 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 and the time of your life that will have passed by, what will you have done with it? How will you have redeemed the time? What kind of legacy are you leaving for those who will come after you, whether that's children, whether that's a spouse, whether that's coworkers, whether, whatever, whether that's your neighbors, 
What kind of legacy are you going to leave? What kind of mark are you leaving on this world for Jesus? Not so that they would remember you, but so that they would remember the God who saves, the God who's given everything, the God who is love, the God who is gracious and merciful and compassionate. How are we buying up opportunities to be a witness and a light for Jesus with our lives? Because they're passing, they're passing. And the routine of the day may seem the same and everything around you may seem the same, but you're not, you're growing old. And I don't mean to depress you. <laughs> But I also don't want you to look back 25 years from now and go, man, I wasted my life. I wasted so much time that I, that I could have invested in furthering the kingdom of God and putting in a good word for Jesus because life passes so fast. The Bible says it's, it's but a vapor. It's here one moment, it's gone the next. Psalm uh, chapter 90 verse 12, jot that verse down. Psalm 90 verse 12 says, so, so David says, so teach us God. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days. Redeem the time. Buy it back regardless of what you're doing. You're going for a jog? Redeem the time. Talk to, make that a time where you're able to have, have communication and communion with God in prayer. You're, on your way, you're driving to work in the car. Sometimes we just need to turn the radio off. And begin to talk to the Lord. Or maybe you turn it on and crank some worship and, and everybody thinks you're crazy driving around you, but you're worshiping Jesus. You're redeeming that time. Whether, when you're on the subway, maybe you can read a good book or your Bible. Or something. How are we redeeming? I'm not saying that we have to be all super spiritual in every moment of every day. We have to be doing something. that. It, but what I'm, what I'm saying is we should be asking the Lord into everything we do. Therefore, verse 17, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. It's important for us to understand that our, our, natural, our natural foolishness can only be done away with through divine enlightenment. As Psalm 90 verse 12 says, numbering our days brings wisdom. And we know that because the scripture tells us that. We, we will not understand what the will of the Lord is. And everybody wants to know that. We will not understand what the will of the Lord is if we do not understand his word. If we don't understand his word. Let me read this quick story to you. It was about a, an open forum, this open religious forum that was happening in downtown Chicago many years ago. It says there was an open religious forum downtown and Clarence Darrow was there to represent for the atheists. Another person represented for Protestantism, another for the Roman Catholics, another Judaism. And the Catholic got up and told why he was a Catholic. And the Protestant got up and told why he was a Protestant. And the Jew, why he was a Jew. And then Clarence Darrow, the atheist, got up to speak and said, Gentlemen, I have been very much interested in one thing. I noticed Protestant, Catholic, nor Jew ever ref referenced the Bible. Evidently, they no longer value that so-called holy book as they used to. And then he went on to declare that he was an atheist because he had no use for the book that they would never mention. What a pitiable thing that professed Christians should attempt to tell why they were Catholic or Protestant and never once refer to the Bible. Oh, that you and I might become genuine Bible Christians. This is not just a book to be opened on a Sunday morning. This is spiritual food. And so many look so spiritually famished because they don't partake in spiritual food. If you're not in the habit of reading your Bible, I think the question that we should ask ourselves to start with is, is why? 
Why do I not? Don't allow your why to be time. I just don't have enough time. There is nothing more important than meeting God in His Word. Not our careers, not our education, not any of that stuff. All those things are good, but not as important as this. Not as important as feasting on God's Word. Not as, a, as important as allowing God's Word to get in us and change us and mold us and shape us. So, so what, are some, what are some routines, some disciplines, practically, that we can place in our lives so that we do not find ourselves in a place where we are spiritually famished. There are many different practical things. Some say, well, just wake up earlier. And you're like, what? Dude, I'm still the guy that you got to pour the water on. To, you know? and, and, and for some, you just need to um, pray and spend time with Jesus that you might grow a greater hunger for the things of God. But sometimes it's just little practical things. Something that I used to do and have now this week I got back to doing is I, I say to myself, I will not open up any social media until I've first opened this book. That's for me. Because I'm tired of the first thing I do when I get up in the morning is grabbing a phone and scrolling through it, looking at meaningless posts about nothing that I'll forget two seconds later rather than feasting on the inerrant, infallible word of God, a love letter from God to me. I'm, I'm tired of it. And so because of that, I'm putting that principle in my life so that the first person I talk to, the first person I hear from is not, you know, my mom, Colin from California, is not, it's not, you know, somebody speaking to me through their Instagram, but it's the Lord, that the Lord would be speaking to me. The Lord says, search the scriptures. It's not a suggestion, it's a command. It's a command that we would search the scriptures. Why do you think that there are so many people, both outside the church and inside the church, that profess faith, but in their lives they, they embrace, they cling to all sorts of evil, wickedness, unrighteousness? Why do you think that is? Why do you think there are people who are like, yeah, I'm a Christian, I love Jesus, but stand for so many things that are in opposition to Jesus? I don't think it's because of a lack of, of sincerity. I honestly believe that they're sin they sincerely are saying, I love Jesus. I love, I love Jesus. I don't believe it's, it's a lack of sincerity. I believe that it's a lack of understanding. And I believe that lack of understanding comes from a lack of knowledge of God's Word. Because if we're in God's Word and we know God's Word, we are without excuse. Because we understand where God stands on specific issues and so we then come alongside and stand with Him on those things. We are no longer ignorant. We are no longer without knowledge, but we are with understanding. Give place to His Word and then you'll know His will for your life. And just as a side note, it is far more important for you to know the revealed will of God than it is for you to know the specific we seek like crazy the specific will of God. God, tell me exactly what you want me to do tomorrow. Uh, I, I want to, where do you want me to go, God? Can I pee right now? God, whatever. Like we, we just are like, oh, we, we want to know the specific will of God. And God has given us his word, the revealed will of God. And we neglect it. Work on the revealed will of God and let him worry about the specific. Verse 18, he says, And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation or debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I love these verses. I love the way Paul closes out this section. He does it with this incredible contrast right? Between the, 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 the life that is full of debauchery and drunkenness and the spirit-filled life. He contrasts these two things, which is also kind of hilarious because there are people who do certain things in the name of the Holy Spirit and it looks like they're drunk. Like clucking and barking and rolling around in aisles are being now attributed to the Holy Spirit and the spirit-filled life. 
I'm going to act drunk and run around the church, and I'm just going to, God told me to, no, he didn't, okay? You're acting like an idiot. Um, that's not Bible. It's not in Scripture. But what I love about this most is, is that he doesn't just tell you what not to do, because we're good at that. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. But he also tells us what to do. And he does that all throughout Scripture. Put off the old man, put on the new man. And the same goes here. Do not be drunk, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. People who are drunk with alcohol become impaired. They no longer have full control of their mental faculties. You, you, you do things and you say things that you would never have done or said had you been sober. It's the, it's the wimp that acts like Terminator, right? You ever been there when one of those guys kind of pops off? You're like, dude, uh, stop right now. I'll wax you right now. And I'm a pastor. Okay, so, but, but you, got the, you got people who are just like, all of a sudden, they're, they're, they're quiet, introverted. Now they're kind of boisterous and loud. And, and you become something that, that you're not. That's why people say things like, oh, don't hold it against them. They're drunk. Well, okay. <laughs> and this was needful. This was, this was needful for Paul to say this in this context. Why? Because not only was Ephesus the center of Greek culture, but it was also, it was wine country. And people were constantly dominated by alcoholism. It, it even enslaved some in the church. Paul is not saying having a wine or a beer is sin. What he's saying is drunkenness is debauchery. Drunkenness is a sin. And I love that contrast. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be intoxicated with God. Allow Him to take over the way you think. Be controlled by the Holy Spirit. And it says, be being filled in the Greek. It's just this constant being filled, being in the presence of the Lord. But so many act like crazy people. And, and this is not... Acts 4.31, it says the apostles were filled with the Holy Spirit and they preached with boldness. They didn't freak out. They acted orderly and with common sense. 2 Timothy said, God, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and a what? And a sound mind. Clucking and barking is not a sound mind. So let's stop attributing that kind of stuff to the Holy Spirit. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melodies in your heart to the Lord. Colossians 3.16 is like an exact parallel to this verse. He, he says this twice in the New Testament. So in Colossians 3.16, he says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Even there, there's this um, sort of contrast, only it's not. So if, if, if being filled with the Spirit and being the, filled with the Word has equal result, then being people who are filled with God's Word is the same as being people who are filled uh, with the Holy Spirit. And sometimes... It's not just the encouragement. It is the encouragement. It is the speaking psalms and hymns and spiritual songs over one another. It's, 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 to, it's to be encouraging one another in our walk with the Lord. It's be, that stuff is so important. We need more of that. We need less gossip, less slander, more encouragement, more speaking life and love over one another, encouraging one another in our giftings. Sometimes it, it's a little bit of speaking to ourselves too, isn't it? And I close with this. David, if you remember in, in 1 Samuel chapter 30, had gone to battle. He had gone to war with his, with his brothers in arms. And, and they came back. And when they came back, they found their whole village ravaged on fire. But that wasn't even the worst of it. The worst of it is that their, their wives and their children were taken captive. Every single one of David's men wanted to kill him. You took us away to do that, and now look what happened to our hometown. Where's my wife? Where's my kids? I mean, that was a, that was a tough situation. That was a bad day at work, okay? But the beautiful part of that passage is it says that, that David, in 1 Samuel 30, verse 6, it says that he, he went away and he strengthened himself in the Lord. He strengthened himself in the Lord by writing 
psalms and songs and singing and worshiping. How many of the psalms do we have because David was going through hardships and began to pen under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? He strengthened himself in the Lord. Sometimes we need not just speak psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to one another, but we, we need to do it to ourselves as well. And it was through that worship of the Lord that David and his men came back and they recaptured everything that was taken from them. Sometimes worship is, is the answer to your issue. It's the answer to your issue because your issue is not really that big a deal when you think of how big God is. But we, we magnify things and we make things a bigger deal than they really are. And what, what ultimately puts your issue and your problem, whatever it is you're facing here this morning, what, what ultimately places that puny little issue into the place that it belongs is, is an act of worship. It's when we take our eyes off our circumstance, off ourselves, and we place them on Jesus. And we begin to worship Him for who He is and then recognize that our problems are minuscule compared to our God. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father and the Lord. Listen, may thankfulness be a mark of our lives. I love when a prayer meeting turns into just a time of, of thanksgiving. We are so privileged as a people to know God. And we're to be thankful for all things, he says. Not some things, not most things, but all things. Not just in all things, but for all things, he says there. So when you're going through that trial, you can be thankful for that trial because that trial is making you more like Jesus. When things don't go your way, you should be praising and worshiping Jesus. When the girl or the guy says no, you should be praising and thanking Jesus because he's sparing you from someone that was never meant for you. And most of all, we praise and we worship God because he's deserving of it. And he's worthy of it regardless of, of the hand that life has dealt us. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, God, that